I've put a file for you on iLearn so that you can follow along and do the same things with me that I'm doing in this video. So go ahead and grab that, download it into whatever folder you're working in, then fire up RStudio, and as we've done before, go ahead and open up a new script file. And go ahead and save it, something nice and simple. I'm going to call mine o3cdemo.r. And then once you've saved it, go ahead and set up your header material as we've talked about. You can see my template here. And for section one, I like to work in sections. I think it's helpful to keep things organized, which you should probably call something like load needed files and libraries or driver or whatever works for you. But in section one, let's add a little bit of stuff here. So we're going to start by loading the tidyverse library. And then I told you before to set a working directory, and you can do that if you prefer. I'm going to show you a different technique here. Um, you can use whichever you like. I'm going to create an object that I'm going to call the file path and use that to both open and save files and just not bother touching the working directory. But do whatever works for you. They will both get you the same thing done, and I, I want you to know how to do both. So as you can see, I have a pretty long file path, but it's fine. As long as you get it typed in correctly, R will handle it. And then beneath that, there's one more thing you're going to add. We're going to load the demo file. Now, a technique to note here, if you have set your working directory the way I showed you in the last video, then actually all you need to put here is load and then quotes rustinfoodaccess.rda and pay attention to the capital and lowercase letters, because remember, R is case sensitive. But if you want to do it this other way, then you can use the line right above it that I've got on line 16. So I'm going to delete this one just to not confuse people. If you're doing it the way that I'm showing you now, where you set a file path object, then you're going to use load file.path. Be careful of that underscore versus the dot. The underscore is what our object is called. The dot is for a function. Then in that parenthesis, you'll put the file underscore path, comma, and then the rustinfoodaccess.rda in quotes. So let's run those things. And we can now see that the tidyverse library has loaded, and we have two objects in our environment. The file path object, if you went with this route. If you didn't, you won't have that. And then you should definitely have the rustin object which has 50 observations of 107 variables. All right, that's all we need for that section. So let's set section two. And this is where we will begin doing some of the math. So we'll start with the frequency tables for nominal and ordinal variables. And then later on, we'll move to central tendency and dispersion for ratio variables. A quick orientation to our object. The Rustin food access object is based on a survey that I conducted a few years ago in Ruston, Louisiana. It has a mix of variable types, though most are nominal and ordinal level variables. The unit of analysis is meant to be the household, but the variables that we're going to look at kind of blur that line between household and individual. And we're not going to use everything in here, but I will talk to you about uh, the ones that we're going to use specifically. All right, let's start with two nominal variables that we often encounter in the social sciences, gender and race. Now, I want to pause for just a second here and consider, are gender and race characteristics of households or individuals? Pause the video for a second and think about that for yourself before you go on. So gender is definitely a quality of individuals, not of households. Race could be a household quality if all members in the household share the same racial identity, but it is more accurately an individual level property. As we go through this video and through the different variables in this object, I want you to think about this question. Ask yourself, what is the proper unit of analysis for this variable? Is it truly the household in the way that I've set it up? Or might we more accurately interpret it as the individual who was filling out the survey? And the answer may differ from one variable to the next, but 
hold that in the back of your mind. All right, let's start with gender. If we want to make a frequency table for gender, this is a relatively easy thing to do. You start with the object in question, in this case, Rustin, add a pipe operator, and then we're gonna add a command called group by. And as you notice, this is true for a lot of things, as you start to type certain commands, it will bring up a list for you that you can select from. Group by, if you get to the end of the word group, is usually gonna be the first thing there, and then you can just hit enter and have it. Group by is basically saying, we have a certain variable that we have a set of characteristics within, and we want to group by that set of characteristics. And R will then take care of the complexities of that for you. It doesn't matter what order they're in in the object, R will handle it and group them accordingly. So we are going to do group by gender, because that's our variable, and then pipe again into a command called tally. And tally is just what it sounds like. It tallies up the results. And let's run that. And so down below in the console, we get some output. We see that there are 16 men, 32 women, and two who did not list a gender and we marked as NA. So we have a count. But let's say we also want to get a percentage. Well, it's very easy to go back up here and add a little more. So after tally, add a pipe operator. You need to add a command called ungroup. And there's nothing that goes in this, kind of like with tally but you're gonna to need to do that for what's coming next or R is not going to take the next command properly. You have to tell it to let go of that grouping or it will carry it all the way through the rest of your piping sequence until it reaches the end. And then add another pipe operator. And now we're going to add a verb called mutate, which sounds really freaky, but it's really just saying we're making a change. We're going to mutate a variable into something else. Mutate is a really, really useful function that we are gonna be calling on a lot. It is how we take a variable or <clears throat> some set of variables perhaps and transform them in some way. Maybe we're combining, maybe we're doing math on it, maybe we're creating a whole new variable. There's all sorts of things we can do with it and we'll get to see some different examples in this video. We're gonna start with something very simple. We want to create a column next to the in for total, and we want to call it, let's call it PERC for percent. And then add an equal sign. Then we want to take that column we created called in, and we want to divide it by the sum of the full column in. And then just to get that in something a little more readable, we'll do that times 100. Run that and see what happens. Look at that. Now we have a frequency table that has our gender categories, has our total counts under n, and has a column abbreviated percent that has the actual percentages for this. And so we can see that in this particular sample, it was almost a third men, almost two thirds women, and then a small portion that did not mark a gender and that we listed as na or missing. All right, let's do the same thing again, but this time we're gonna trade out the variable. So we start with our object Rustin, and we pipe it through a group by, this time we use race, and then we're gonna pipe that into tally. And let's go ahead and also finish out the next parts here. We're gonna ungroup, and then we're going to do another mutate. And let's run that. There are a few things to note here. First, only one person marked two or more races. They actually provided their specific racial identity, but I recoded it to preserve anonymity. And you will encounter that kind of thing a lot in surveys. Second, you'll notice that I ran the same material in fewer lines of code. I kept several things packed together on one line. R really doesn't care. I could have kept everything on one line if I wanted to, and R would have just run with it. So how many lines it takes is really up to your own sense of aesthetics and readability. Usually I do break this down a little bit more because I think it is easier to read code one command per line at a time, but occasionally certain things I will group together. And we'll show different examples of that as we continue forward. Now, 
the only thing that changed here was the variable name. If we have multiple similar variables to run, in this case, we're using the exact same thing. We're just changing out gender for race. Maybe we have others like that we want to do that with. So it may beg the question, can we just reuse the same lines and trade out the variables? And the short answer is yes, but. Remember that we want our script files to contain our full process. If you're submitting something to me and I need to be able to check what you've done, if you've traded out the variable in one particular spot, all I'm going to see is the last variable you put there. And I'll have no idea that you included other variables previously. If somebody else were to come and run it behind you, they may not know that there are other variables that need to be included. Now, there is a way to automate this and do what's called a loop to take care of that. That's a little bit more than I want to get into today, but one of the things we'll talk about in next week's video is how to write a loop for this very kind of phenomenon. And then before we move on, the last thing to note here is that it's pretty easy to tell where the mode is in this distribution. We can look down at that table and see that clearly the greatest value with 86% is those who mark their racial identity as white. And we saw a similar thing up here at gender where the mode is clearly women. Okay, let's move on to some ordinal level variables. A lot of questions in the social sciences, particularly in social science surveys, ask about people's attitudes and opinions. And these are usually coded on what's called a Likert scale. And the Rustin Food Survey had several such questions. We asked how important certain characteristics were in their food purchasing behaviors. And the options ranged from very unimportant to somewhat important to neither important nor unimportant to somewhat important to very important. And we marked those in the coding from one to five, where one is the least important and five is the most important. Let's start with the variable quality. How important is quality in your food purchasing decisions? So we can take the code from up above and we'll take the one from race and copy it over. And instead of race, we're going to put quality. Let's run that. And we can see based on the, what we know about the coding that a full 92% of people said that quality was somewhat or very important in their food purchasing decisions. And it's very easy to see from this table, looking at the, the percent column and quickly adding up 78, which is clearly the mode, plus 14, which is the next largest. And since those are right next to each other, it makes sense to collapse it in this way. Now, we could keep going in this way, but if we have a lot of similar variables as we do here, that's kind of tedious. And it may make more sense to present the frequencies side by side. So I'm going to show you how to do that. And to do so, I'm going to have to introduce you to three more verbs in R. And those are the select verb and two verbs that are part of the pivot series. Let's start with select. We use select to simplify the variables in a data object. And it's very simple to use. You pipe your object of interest into select, and then you list the specific variables you want to keep. Now, you should always keep some kind of an identification column. And in this case, we have one that is simply called ID. And then we are interested in the variables quality, cost, being local, and organic. And you could add other stuff if you want to, but let's stick with these for now. If we were to just run this, what we would see is just those columns from the data set output to the screen. Not very helpful for us, but that's okay. That's a way to test that we're doing things correctly as we go along. Let's continue to pipe that through the pivot command we're gonna use first. We're gonna use two. We need to start with one called pivot longer. And note that there's an underscore in between those two words. The pivot longer command will get our data into a format that's kind of hard for a person to read, but a lot easier for a computer to work with. What it's going to do is take each person's answers and give a separate row 
per question. In its most basic form, Pivot Longer has three essential components. The first piece is where we tell it what columns to include in the pivot. Now we've already selected the columns we want in the line above, but we need to tell the pivot longer command to ignore the ID column because that is our reference column that needs to stay constant throughout. And we do that in this case by putting an exclamation point at the front of something. An exclamation point tells R not this. So we want to say not the ID column, but by default, that means take everything else. And then the other two arguments we have to include are the names to and the values to. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the names of each of these columns, the organic and cost and quality and all of that, and we're going to put that into a vector called characteristic. And then we're going to take the values, the different numbers we have, and we're going to put that into a vector called importance. And just to see what that looks like, you can run that. And now, woo, we have a lot going on here. We still have the ID column, but note that for each particular ID in there, there is now a characteristic for quality, cost, being local, and organic. And then there's the associated value. Not something that you or I would want to look at, but R is going to use this to do the next step. The next step now is to pipe that into our old friends group by and tally. And this time, the group by is actually going to contain two variables. We'll use the two that we just created, characteristic and importance. And then we will tally that. And just to see what that looks like, we'll run that. There's still a lot of information, but look what it did. We now have a total value for each characteristic of interest, or in our case, really each variable of interest, and the overall importance level. But that's still kind of hard to read. So to get that into a grid that is a little bit more human friendly, we're going to add one more pipe operator and bring in the last verb that I mentioned. This is going to be pivot wider. Now, if pivot longer made the data very long, as we saw a moment ago. Pivot wider is going to send it in the other direction. And pivot wider much like pivot longer, has a few essential arguments that have to be included. The only two that you absolutely must always include in a pivot wider are the two on line 47, names from and values from. And note, it's the inverse of what we just saw in pivot longer, where we had names to and values to. In this case, we're going to take the names from characteristic, and we're going to put those back into our variable names. And then we're going to take the values from the column in and store those into our new grid. And you'll notice there's another piece here after that last comma, and I entered it down partly to help with readability. This is where how you orient things on the page can matter. We've got this thing called values underscore fill equals list parenthesis in equals zero. This is optional. We don't have to include it. If we don't, we're going to end up with an NA in the middle of our mix because we saw with quality that the value 3 was missing. Nobody marked 3 for that question. So you don't have to include this. It'd be fine to have an NA. But for streamlineness, I often like to include the 0 here. Sometimes if we're going to continue with this and do yet further calculations, having the 0 helps to prevent further problems down the road. So let's take this and run the whole thing. And now we have a very easy to read table where in the first column we have the listing of importance. Remember that one is very unimportant and five is very important. And then we have the different variables of interest. They're not in the same order. We could fix that if we wanted to, but I'm not going to worry about that. We have being local, cost, organic, and quality. And if we look across that, it's fairly easy to see where the numbers are the biggest Clearly, quality is very important. Cost is also pretty important, but maybe not as important. It looks like being local has a modest importance to people. And then the one for organic is kind of spread all over the place. Let's do one more example, this time using a variable that should be ratio, but is often treated as ordinal. Income has a very, very wide possible range. And in this survey, we clustered it into 10 categories. 
Note that these categories are not uniform. And note also that income, both in the real world and in this sample, are not evenly distributed. Let's look at this and see what we're talking about here. So we can see that the different categories we have are not even. The space between 16,001 to 25,000 is far smaller than that between 150,001 to 250,000, for example. We can also see that a lot of the incomes in this sample are towards the upper middle end of the spectrum. And let's also note that we have some missing values. We'll talk more about how to handle those next week. Now, this data set does have a few actual ratio variables, so let's turn to some of those and see how we'd work with ratio variables. When we are looking at ratio variables, we don't want frequency distributions. We want the mean, the median, and some metrics of dispersion. And we often call that full set of metrics the summary statistics. Now, there are two ways to get summary statistics in R. There is a built-in summary command, which will give us everything but the standard deviation. In this case, we type summary, parenthesis, all lowercase, the name of the object we're interested in, and then a dollar sign, which tells R, look within that object for this particular variable that comes after the dollar sign. And so let's start with year. We know that year is a ratio variable, and so we'll use that here. It, what is the year you were born? And when we run that command, R gives us some really useful summary output. It tells us that the minimum value was 1922, the maximum was 1989, there was a median of 1956, a mean of 1958, and the first and the third quartile. This is convenient, but it's not very dynamic. So I don't want you to use this often. I show it to you so you're aware of it, but this is really not the primary thing you should be turning to. You really should continue to use things that utilize the pipe operator. So let me show you how to do that with one more command to introduce you to. We're going to start as usual typing out our object called Rustin, and we're going to pipe that into Summarize. Now, this approach requires a bit more text to code up, but as we'll see in a bit, it's much more flexible than Summary. Let's start with the basics. Let's just put in the minimum, the median, the mean, and the maximum. And you'll notice what I've done here is I've labeled everything. That's what comes on the left side of the equal sign. And then on the right side of the equal sign, I've given some other command to work with. And these are yet some other commands that are built into R. min, min, which gives the minimum. At the end there, max, max for the maximum. And then median and mean. And then within parentheses for each of those, we have the variable that we are interested in. And if we run that, we get a shorter version of what we got in the summary command. But we can add to that. At the end here, let's also add the standard deviation. And I'm calling that stdev, and the command for that is sd parenthesis. We can also add in the quartiles. And to do that, we're going to need to use the quantile function. So I'm calling it Q1, and then we will also add in what I'll update, Q3. And the way the quantile function works is it's quantile, and then the variable of interest, and then probs, which is short for probability to use. And then since we want the 25th percentile, which is what the quantile function gives us, we would put 0.25. And we want the 75th for the third quartile, so we put 0.75. And now we have an entire set of summary statistics. Something to note up here on the way we've labeled the first and the third quartile, you'll notice that I did not put it 1Q and 3Q. I put it Q1 and Q3. And that's because R doesn't like it when you create a new variable or vector that begins with a numeral. So always make sure you begin with a character. All right, let's try this again, but with the variable time. 
and you can just copy and paste and trade out year for time if you like, rather than retyping it all. The question here asked how much time they typically spend per week preparing food for their household. And let's run that and see what happens. Uh-oh, we have an error. And what this is telling us is that not everyone provided an answer for this variable. So there is at least one in A, meaning not applicable or not available, in this data set. And all of the functions that we are putting in Summarize require that. And in fact, if we take out the quantile function, which is specifically referenced in that error code below, we'll see still a problem. It'll now calculate, but because of those NAs, it's not giving us anything useful. So let's make some adjustments in here by adding in this na.rm equals true argument to each line in our code. And since it's another argument to the functions, we want to put it inside the parenthesis for the function, but make sure there's a comma separating it from anything else that was in there. And now when we run this, we actually get values for everything. Now, when I say that the summarize command is more flexible than the summary command, I mean that in two ways. And one of those we can see already. We can include more metrics. Really, we can include as many as we wanted to here. This format also allows us to split out a ratio variable by some subgroups. So let's say, for example, that we are interested in racial differences along time usage. We could come back up here right after the first pipe operator and before the summarize command, and we could add a group by command with race. And don't forget to add the pipe operator at the end. And now when we run it, it does the same thing calculated for each racial group. Now, since only one person marked two or more races, we should ignore that line. There's a lot of, it's not useful. It's just one person's values, and you can't calculate a standard deviation off of only one value anyway. But it looks like there is a difference between white and black households. So if we look at the values for those lines, particularly starting with the mean and the median, it looks like in terms of the mean, black households tend to spend a little more time in food preparation than white households. But there's a little bit more skew going on because white households have a slightly higher median and definitely a higher maximum than black households. It's a small data set. We shouldn't read too much into this, but there's a simple example right there of how we might start to interpret data from numerical output. Of course, we could also look at this graphically, but I do think it's important for you to understand how to interpret the numbers as well as the graphs. But let's turn to thinking about the graphical output. Now, R has multiple ways to graph things, but I'm gonna teach you the portion of this that um, is both the most dynamic and also can fit, as we will eventually see, with some of the pipe operators, although we will get to that specifics later. But what you need to know about right now is what is called ggplot. ggplot is basically a language form for doing graphical output, and it allows you to build graphics in layers. You typically start with specifying the data source and then specifying the x and y axes in the very first line, and then you add lines for what type of graph you want. And then you can also add other lines to format the output and make it look pretty. Done right, you can make some amazing figures in R. For now, we're going to focus on just getting the basics down, and we'll add in those bells and whistles later on. The first line generally looks like this. ggplot, the name of your object, in this case we're using Rustin, a comma, and then AES, which is short for aesthetics. And this is where you put your mappings in. You put another parenthesis, and then at the very least, you're typically going to have an X equals some variable and a Y equals some variable. In some cases, you'll actually only have one of those, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Then at the end, you're going to put a plus sign 
which is similar to the pipe operator, but ggplot was developed before the pipe operator came into existence, and it still uses this old nomenclature. But if you put the plus and hit enter, it will tab things in the way that a pipe operator allows you to. And then you put the kind of geom that you want. I should also pause here and say that if you want to be really formal about what's going on in the ggplot line, what you really have here is ggplot parenthesis data equals and then the object. And then after your comma, you're putting in some mapping variables. So mapping equals this aesthetic function. You can put that. It, that's particularly useful as you're learning just to help you keep track of what's going on. But as long as you put things in the right order, R understands all of this stuff. And so you don't have to put that there. But occasionally you may want to, so it's good to be aware of that. Okay, for our first example, we're going to build a bar chart of gender. And for bar charts, we actually only need the x-axis. So we can put gender after the x, and then let's get rid of that y part of it there. And then down here on the line after the plus, we are going to put geom bar. It's really geom underscore bar. And right now we don't have to add anything else. We can just do that and run it. And if you look on the right or if you zoom, you will get a bar chart that looks something like this. Now we have represented visually what we saw in our frequency table. Let's try this same thing again but this time, let's use the variable organic. And again, we see a graphical output of what we had seen in that frequency distribution table. But now we can even more immediately see that answers on this question of how important is choosing organic food in your food purchasing decisions it is really all over the map. People have very, very different opinions about this. Clearly, there's a mode in the middle, but it is not a normal distribution. There's a fair number of people who say not important, but a fair number who say it is. It's kind of interesting to look at here. Could you do this as a pie chart? In short, yes, but it's very challenging in R. That's actually some really advanced graphics work because you have to add polar coordinates and it just gets weird. But also, I strongly suggest you don't. To a lay person, pie charts are often cool and Excel makes it easy to create them, as does PowerPoint because it's part of the same suite. But here's the issue. Consider the organic variable we just looked at in bar chart and pie chart format. Humans have a notoriously difficult time reading angles. If the point of visuals is to convey information, we want it to be very easy to see. The differences by category are much easier to tell in the bar chart than in the pie chart. And if we took away the bar chart and hadn't already shown you one, you'd probably have an even a harder time telling what's really going on here. The only time that pie charts are useful is when you are comparing two or at most three categories and when they have very different values. That's a very particular use case. Let's do one final bar chart, this time for the variable year. Now, because geom bar assumes a categorical variable, it's taking each individual year listed as its own group. So this is kind of hard to read, but it also looks like there might be a little logical clustering going on. So can we fix this? Now, if you're paying attention, the year variable and if you had run it, the uh, income variable, although we didn't, they sort of look like histograms. A histogram displays a single continuous variable by dividing the x-axis into bins 
and counting the observations in each bin. Since our version of income is discrete, we're going to skip it here. We skipped it on the bar chart too, but you could run it yourself if you're interested in seeing what that looks like. But let's set this up for year. So we're going to do ggplot as usual. Object is Rustin. AES is going to now be x equals year. When we run this, it gives us something very similar to the bar chart, but a little bit cleaner. But if we're looking at the bottom down here in the console, it also gives us a warning, not exactly an error, but something to be aware of. The default is to divide the data into 30 evenly spaced bins. But we saw in the summary statistics that our year variable runs from 1922 to 1989. That's a range of 67 years, and that doesn't really divide well by 30, does it? So let's try either specifying the number of bins or specifying the bin width. And we can do that in the geom histogram line. Let's start by trying bins equals 14. Okay, that's a little bit cleaner. I mean, the data are kind of messy, so we're not going to get anything perfect. But that's something that's kind of useful and logical to think about. We could also try it using an argument called bin width. And let's try saying every five years should be a cluster. So bin width equals five. Also much cleaner to look at. The point here is that sometimes when presenting data visually, you may have to play around a little bit to see what works. Remember that the purpose of a visual is always, always, always to help tell a story. So you'll need to think about the story behind this variable. To further illustrate this point, let's do this again with the time variable. We already know that time ranged from 1 to 20, and a glance at the summary statistics tells us that it's not normally distributed. So let's try pre-specifying the bin width to one hour increments. So this is a little hard to interpret. All right, what happens if we set the width to two hour increments? Hmm. Okay. This suggests at least two clusters of people, those who put very little time into their food prep. And when we say little, we mean little. And those who put in 10 hours or more per week, though mostly they're estimating about 10 hours. But let's look at what happens when we use a five hour increment window for our bin count. Hmm. Well, it's still skewed, but it's starting to look like a smoother distribution. And now it suggests that most people are putting in about five hours per week in food prep. A few people who do about 10 and a handful who do either a lot more or almost none. I suspect that we don't know the full story here yet, and it's likely there's another variable that might help explain it. Some likely candidates might include whether or not there are children in the home, or whether or not there are multiple adults or maybe even gender. There's even a variable on how often they eat out. If people eat out a lot, that would mean they spend less time on food prep at home. Hold that thought because histograms are not the best way of showing such things. Box plots are a bit better for side-by-side -side comparison. So let's start by simply creating a box plot for this variable. So again, we have ggplot Rustin. AES. This time, because we're changing the axis, we're going to put time on the Y axis instead of the X. And the command for this is simply geom underscore box plot. Let's run that and see what happens. Okay. Not bad. Not pretty, but it tells us some interesting stuff here. We now have the summary statistics visually embedded in this figure. If you remember what I said in the other video, the box here shows us the interquartile range. So this bottom line here is the 
first quartile, the 25th percentile. The top line is the third quartile. This middle line is the median. And then we can see the whiskers going up and down from either side down to the minimum and up to the almost maximum. And then there's this outlier of 20 hours up here at the top. All right, that's cool. Let's try adding one of those other dimensions that we just mentioned. How about gender? Now to do this, we need to go back up to the ggplot line and within the AES section, we need to add a new argument. So after that y equals time, put comma, space, and then try fill equals gender. And run that and see what happens. Ooh, now we have some color, that's kind of nice. But we also have some divisions by gender. Recall that we had two people who did not specify their gender, so it's kind of hard to make much meaning out of that box plot, so we're going to ignore the gray one on the right. But let's look at the pink and the blue ones. So if we compare these two plots, what do we see? Well, it looks like the median value is equivalent for men and women, so that's interesting. But the distribution, the overall range for women is much narrower than it is for men, and we see that represented both in the whiskers but also in the interquartile range. Of course, there is at least one woman in there who marked 20 hours, but clearly that was much more of an outlier than we saw for the men. All right, let's uh, try one other variable on this. What if instead of gender, we decided to check out children in the home? I mean, children, especially young children, take up a lot of a parent's time. So maybe there's just less time available for food prep. Now. Because of how this variable is coded, you're going to need to not just put fill equals children, you're going to have to put fill equals factor parenthesis children. This is because at the moment the way it's coded, R thinks that children, which is a raw count, it's a ratio variable technically, is just a bunch of numbers, and with the way we're trying to divide it, you have to trick it into treating that as discrete categories, and the factor function does this. So let's try running this. Okay, that's interesting. How do we work with this? So because the count of children goes as high as four, this is kind of messy to read. So let's make one more adjustment back here. And instead of just factor children, let's do factor for children greater than one. We're going to trick it into not only making categories out of this, but binarizing that. So it looks like there's some similarities between those with no children and those with one child, that's the pink and the kind of gold color, that are distinct from two, three, or even four children. Let's see if this tells us a slightly cleaner story. And it looks like, yes, there is a slightly cleaner story going on here. If you have more than one child in the home, you tend to spend a lot less time in the kitchen than if you have one or no children in the home. You could try this for other variables too. There are all sorts of things you could put in here as well. Um, I'm sure we do not yet have the full story still. You could try putting race or adults or how often they eat out. If you look at eat out, remember that zero is never, and then it goes to rarely, sometimes, often, and always. But I'll let you play with that on your own time if you're interested. Box plots are nice, but I think the real visual winner is the violin plot. Violin plots show the peaks and valleys of a distribution, much as a histogram does, but they also allow us to compare things side by side like a box plot. Let's try the year variable as a violin plot instead. Now, in this case, we need to specify both the x and the y axis. Like a box plot, y should be our variable of interest, so y equals year. But we're going to have to put something for x. For the moment, let's just make it a static label, and we'll just call it Rustin, since that's the town all the data came from. And later I'll show you how to turn that into a variable instead. When we run this, we see basically what the histogram was trying to hint at but smoothed out and put on the y-axis instead, of course. Let's do that again with the time variable. 
So this seems to show a bit of a compromise in what we were trying with only modest success to show with the bar chart. Now let's add back in that variable for children and see what happens. Huh, interesting. Now we can see the time distribution broken out by whether or not people have more than one children in the home. Just for fun, and to compare what happens here, because it's good to play around, let's get rid of the fill argument there and make it x equals factor of children greater than one. Interesting. We lose the color, and so we lose the legend, but now the labels of the true and false on the bottom instead of it saying simply Rustin. All right, put that back in for a second here. Let's do one more change because the violin plot will even let us fit in one more variable into our presentation. If we put children back into the fill, but change X into gender, not in quotes because we want it to reference the variable, and let's do one more quick change just to avoid some uh, errors due to our very small sample size. Let's now make this children greater than zero instead of children greater than one. Run that and see what happens. So we are now at a point that we have divided a very small sample too much to meaningfully interpret. So we're not going to try to make sense of what this graph is telling us. But my point here is to show you that you can incorporate multiple variables into one graph. Technically, that is not univariate analysis, but it seemed like the right place to bring that up anyway. So in one graph, we have now put together the dimension of time with the components of how many children are in the home, in this case, whether there are any, and the gender of the respondent. That's a lot of information to pack into one graph. And if we had a larger sample size, we would probably have something really interesting and meaningful to interpret. All right, one final thing, and then we'll stop for now. I want to show you how to create multiple graphical layers. So let's grab that last bit of code we wrote for the last violin plot, copy that over, go ahead and turn gender back into that static value of Rustin. And then at the end here of the Geom violin, add a plus, enter down, and add the code for a box plot. And then to improve readability, we're going to add a few other things to our code. Inside of the Geom box plot, we're going to add fill equals white, and white is in quotes, and alpha equals 0.5. Don't worry too much about what that means right now. I'll explain that in a future video. And then up here inside the ggplot and the AES, first let's change that back to children greater than 1. And then let's come over here to the front of that, enter down, just to make a little more readability here, twice. Because in the middle, we're going to also add group equals factor of children greater than one. So we've got the same thing about children inserted for both a group and a fill argument. And let's run that and see what we end up with. In this specific example, though not a whole lot of information is gained in this way, we now get all of the best of both worlds, the box plot and the violin plot together. My point here is simply to show you that you can put multiple geon types in the same graph, assuming, of course, that they share similar characteristics. And sometimes that can be very valuable. All right, we're going to stop there for now. But let's take a moment to just think about all of the stuff that got packed into this video. You have learned a lot of new commands here, and we're going to be using many of these again and again going forward, and eventually we'll learn some of the nuances of each of them as well. Next week, I will show you how to add other features to your graphs to make them a little bit prettier than the standard output that we get from R. But that is a little bit involved, and I don't want to overwhelm you more than I perhaps already have. We'll also return to this idea of looping through data. And then a little bit then and a little in the week after, we'll talk some about how to import and clean data that we might find out in the wild somewhere. And how do you wrangle data into a format that you can do some really good analyses with?